Welcome to our morning worship hour here at Palekka Baptist Temple. Before we get started with our message, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for our church, our church families, and the leaders in our country. It appears that things are beginning to swing a little bit in our favor that we can, can actually meet back together here on 908 North State Road 19 here at Palekka. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessings on the message, as well as each one of you today. Dear Lord, please know that as we are very grateful for you as you have carefully watched over each one of us. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, went to the cross and died for our sins. We're thankful that you have uh, been with our church during our, this time, been with our families, Lord, we need that you. We need you to be with our country. Lord, I pray that uh, our country uh, still is not turned back to you, even with all of this that's going on. Lord, they need your hand in their life. Lord, they need to realize that any blessing comes from you. And Lord, we thank you for all your blessings and your watch care over us here at our church in Palatka. We ask that you will continue to be with us. Please, Lord, we ask that you'll be with our president, keep him safe, keep him on the right track. I pray that you will bless all the medical staff as they deal with all the situations yet uh, to be done. We have almost 50 cases here in our county. We ask that you'll be with each one of those families today. And Lord, please, we ask that you'll get us all back together soon. And when we come back together, I pray we'll have a greater desire to serve than ever before. And so, Lord, today, I ask that you will use a simple message, touch someone's heart, someone's life today. In Christ we pray, amen. You would open your Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis in chapter 22. Genesis 22 is one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. Uh, I usually say that about almost every story I tell, or every story I read about. But in reality, it is one of my favorites about Abraham and Isaac. But today's message is about something's missing, something's going to rot, something's wrong, and we want to talk about that today. Genesis 22, verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering, upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder, and worship, and will come again to you. Verse 6 says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and then they both went of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Boy, what a question. Isaac is saying, Dad, something's missing. We got the wood, we got the fire, we got the knife. Don't have a sacrifice. I'm not sure Abraham had explained all this to him yet. Evidently he hadn't, or he wasn't listening. But you know, sometimes you just figure out, and like Isaac did, something was missing. When the University of Central Florida built a new stadium there in Orlando. It was an awesome stadium, had all the new perks of a NFL stadium, in fact. And on the first home game of the new state in the new stadium, something was missing. People started dropping like flies in the heat of the day. It was so hot that people were dehydrated so bad that they were actually having to go to the hospital. People started giving the people in the stands and people in the concession stands started giving the water away. Problem was they ran out of water. And they by halftime they had none at all. Come to find out that they built that 45,000 seat stadium without any water coolers in it. State codes demanded that they have one cooler for every thousand seats. 
They had none. They apologized for what happened that day. They found out that something was missing. You know, few things are as perplexing mentally than when those moments when we sense that there's something wrong, something's missing, but we cannot determine or know exactly what it is, whether it's due to absent-mindedness, change in our habits. See, there's, there's an instinct that warns us of our being blind to the oblivious, and sometimes we are just that. Perhaps that is what Isaac was thinking when he spoke um, to his father, Abraham on, the, on his way to Mount Moriah, in chapter two, 22, verse seven, behold the fire, the wood, where's the lamb? Isaac realized the vital piece of the offering was missing. It may be that he had not figured out, as I said earlier, that he was the sacrifice. He was the major part here. As the world spirals into moral decadence and social instability, economic failure, our spiritual instincts tells us that something's missing, something's wrong. While we may quickly point to the government, we may point to the courts, the educational system, but I wonder how easily it is that we can recognize a more serious missing element. We're witnessing the effects of a society that's really left to function without a spiritual influence at all. And that is so sad. See, the absence of a spirit-filled Christian on the front lines has lifted the enemy's restraints. And that has deprived the world of a clear demonstration of God Almighty. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, a holy church is an awful weapon in the hand of God. When right, the church is a force to be reckoned with. When wrong, the church fails in the face of ridicule and a lost world. So why is it that we're seeing the shrinking of the Christian influence today? Why is that? I think it's because we're, uh, we're, we're leaving our convictions. Christians, the church, uh, Christendom as we know it today have left their convictions. Have you ever walked away from a conversation with someone that, and, and you, as you walked away, you thought to yourself, something was missing there. See, when enemies observe the supernatural strength of the man in the book of Judges called Samson, and they saw how careless he was with his calling, with his conviction, they heard about him. They heard that he was a religious man, that he was following God, and all of a sudden he finds himself always with a woman of a pagan land. Surely they were left to wonder, is he of God really? In Judges chapter 16, we're told of the demise of Samson through a woman by the name of Delilah. It says, the Philistine, she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and he said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. But the Bible says then he wished not that the Lord had departed from him. I think those are some of the saddest words in all the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. He wished not that the Lord had departed. What a reminder that a man who does not take his conviction seriously, in fact, he will forfeit the manifested power of God upon his life, just like Samson. See, we live in a generation that is guided by the herd mentality. However, the price for going alone with the crowd means that we must trade our convictions for opinions and truth for feelings. See, the moment a man no longer holds the conviction of right and wrong, he discards the compass by which his position is being checked, and that would be the word of God. Such a crisis of conviction will always leave a people susceptible to evil leadership, evil di direction in their life. Perhaps that is why the theologian said, the Christian way is not the middle way between two extremes, but the narrow way between two precipices. Now, skepticism and cynicism have always been the tools of our enemies. But there can never be courage to stand against such foes where there are not also unshakable convictions. Secondly, we are lacking in character. There's a familiar story in the New Testament and it's found in the book of Luke in chapter two. And as soon as I say Luke two, you're thinking the birth of Christ, but I want to go a little beyond that. We find in the original home alone story in the Bible, a day after Joseph and Mary were returning home from the Passover. I can imagine Mary 
going into her house and with her checklist and making sure she has everything. She has her purse. She has her jewelry. She has her blankets. And all of that is there. And then all of a sudden it hits her. Where's Jesus? My son, where is he? Luke chapter 2 and verse 45 records the moment where it says, And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. What a reminder of how easily our life can drift from a conscious awareness of the Lord's presence in our life. See, it is in these moments that we become most dangerous, not to the world, but to ourselves. Have you ever, have you ever had the experience of taking a bite of food and thinking to yourself, man, that looked good, but oh, it just didn't taste right? There was something missing? There's some food at Chinese restaurants I go to, the desserts. You ever go to desserts there? They look great. They're all pretty. You bite into it and it's kind of like fluff. Nothing. Doesn't have any flavor. Has some texture, but no flavor. Something's missing. See, without the right seasoning, even the best foods can taste dull and bland. The Christian life that is missing the Lord's seasoning presence will without fail leave a bad taste in the mouth of the lost world. See, it was Lot's compromise where the Bible says he seemed as one that mocked his son-in-laws. It was because of David's adultery that he gave great occasion to the enemy of the Lord to blaspheme. It was because Israel imitated the lifestyle of the Babylonians. In captivity, the pagans had to remind themselves, these are the people of the Lord? Really? See, the old Scottish minister who I love to read is George Duncan. He said, the fruit of the Spirit is not excitement or orthodoxy, it is character. See, the only thing that can prevent the manifested witness of Jesus Christ within us is the limitations of our own character. But then thirdly, we are limited in capability. Have you ever been in the midst of an assembly of trying to put together a project, a cabinet, a, a dresser, or a bed, a playpen, as, a, as when you have babies, and you get, in, you get right in the middle of assembling that product, and then it dawns on you as you're putting it together, where's that piece? Where's that part? In my case, when I find that there's a part missing, I say, where's Pat? And I reach in, and I get my cell phone, and I call Pat. I say, I need you to come help me. So we find the prophet here named Elisha. He began to build the school of the prophets. Lumber was, uh, was a real need for the construction in 2 Kings in chapter 6. But the interesting thing happens in verse 5. It says, but as one was felling a beam, cutting wood, the axe head fell into the water. Listen, no matter how much he would swing that handle, a handle without an axe head, at best, all he could do is skin the bark off. It ain't going to do much good. It ain't going to chop down any tree. What a picture of someone trying to complete a task without the aid of the Holy Spirit. See, the one mistake that we're all prone to make is that trying to do the will of God in the strength of the flesh, in our own power, in our own wisdom, in our own way. See, a lost world is neither threatened nor intimidated by us. When we measure God's power by our own grit, by our own resolve, by our own determination. The 17th century theologian John Owen said, we have no power from God unless we live in the persuasion that we have none in our own. See, all of those who became giants in the faith were those whose successes could only be explained by the presence of God and God's power in their life. Again, you go back and you think of Moses. He could only stretch out his hands, but it was God's power that parted the sea. Elijah could only call out in prayer, but it was God's power that, that sent the fire. Elijah, uh, excuse me, Elisha could only pray and ask in prayer, but it was God's power that brought life back to the widow's son, to the woman's son. Three Hebrew children went into the fire, but it was the power of God that brought them out with no smell of smoke upon their clothes. Peter met the beggar in the temple, but it was the power of Jesus Christ that healed him that day. And until we're broken from all of self-glory, it is doubtful that we will ever, ever know just how much of God's power we can stand beneath. 
from time to time, a pastor will preach a simple message such as this one. And somewhere along the way in the simplicity may hear something that could change a person's life. See, it's to my desire that within some of my messages that such would actually happen. There was one message, not that I preached, but there was a statement once that changed the course of Christendom as we know it today. The preacher was named Henry Barley. He was a pastor who was in a simple conversation with a man by the name of Dwight. And they began to converse, and the statement came from the pastor, and the statement was this. The world has yet to see what God will do with a man fully consecrated to him. Dwight could not let that go. That statement kept haunting him. It sort of just stayed with him. He, he went home and he wrote it down and he began to contemplate over it and he went over and over it again. And the statement, the world has yet to see what God will do with a man fully consecrated to him. As the white wrestled that evening, day and night, next day and next night, he finally concluded in his own statement, he said, I'll be that man. I'll be that man. That was the event that gave Dwight a spiritual electrical charge. See, people never would have been able to reach Christ, uh, came to Christ simply because he said, I will be that man. That man was D.L. Moody. And we know him today, the great evangelist that touched two continents for God. So I ask you today, would you be that person? Would you be that one that let God touch your life? Would you be that woman, that young person, so that your wife, your husband, your friends, your neighbors, they're waiting for you to stand tall and be that person. The world awaits to see such a one. Have you ever stared in the mirror and in spite of any success, any achievements, or any notoriety thought brought to yourself and your thoughts, Something's missing. Men will often go to great extremes to evade coming face to face. Not with God, not with their neighbor, not with their boss, but actually with themselves. Augustine wrote this. He said, men go abroad, abroad to wonder at the heights of mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the river, at the vast compass of the ocean, at the circular motions of the stars, and they pass by themselves without wondering. Without wondering. See, when looking for that which is missing, the most obvious thing may just be the most overlooked thing. See, that most overlooked thing, most people, is most people in most people's lives is the presence of God. See, that only comes through salvation. The power of God, the presence of God comes when a person receives Jesus Christ, when they have that relationship with Christ. And I hope and pray today that you have one. But if you do not, it is my prayer that you would today. Would you bow your head, please? And maybe after, while well, your heads are bowed, I will lead you in a prayer. Maybe you would pray this simple prayer today. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. And thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Please forgive my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. I ask you into my life and heart to be my Savior. I want to serve you with my whole heart in Jesus' name. Christian, today, maybe you're here and maybe you're thinking, well, I didn't have to pray that prayer. But let me ask you, Christian, do you need to pray for forgiveness in your life? Do you need to pray for that thing that's missing in your life? Is it the power of God? It was in several men that we talked about today. Listen, maybe you need to pray and ask God for forgiveness and for power in your life. Why not bow your head and pray a prayer similar to this? Lord Jesus, bring me to a fresh place of godly sorrow for my sin. Lord, I know that I'm saved, but I come to you with repentance for my sin. They have weighed me down long enough. And Lord, I know that you want me to live a vibrant Christian life. There is no power like that found in the gospel that can convict me and humble me and strengthen me and guide me for doing all the things for the glory of God and not for the glory of the flesh. Thank you, Lord, for your grace because with your grace, it brings freedom. It brings guilt.
It brings uh, us freedom to, to repent of our sin. Lord, great is your faithfulness and sufficient is your grace today. And Lord, I pray for these folks today that hear this message, that they will know Christ as their Savior or the pardon of their sins after they're saved. In Christ's name we pray.